Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, the fact that you're watching this means that you are, you care about California and you want the best for it. So thank you so much for tuning in today. And um, today we will be talking about SB 679 and uh, what that is and how that would impact rental property owners. And so we want you, and not just us, honestly, it, it, it impacts the entire everybody in the whole state and definitely adversely impacts everyone and um, you know for a long time I, I lived in another country where the government was very big and um, I saw money just not used well I saw that what it did was the bigger the government was the fewer opportunities that regular people had and um, you know we want to be able to create opportunity for people to um, to make a way and to have uh, everything that that they could want and uh, that they could be able to set goals and do that and so that's politically that's how we're motivated we want you as apartment owners to realize your dream and uh, and realize your goals and so we know a big part of that is having legislation, having a, an environment that is friendly to rental property owners. And so, um, but also we realize it actually impacts life in a positive way for everyone. Anyway, so um, every two, every two, about the Tuesday of, la of every month, we have the Take Action Tuesday. Just want you to be aware of it. And you can go to AOAUSA.com forward slash pack and uh, that's Political Action Committee. You could go to that page and we have different things that you can do, ways that you can take action, and we try to keep you informed there. And I think just the last thing that we did on that page, I believe we have it up now, is a, um, a paper on rent control. And I know that even among apartment owners, there are those that um, think maybe, hey, it's okay to have rent control because the other guy down the street, he really needs it. And uh, this paper goes into that, and it would, and um, I think you could, might emerge from that with a, a, a strong, a stronger uh, will to oppose it in its every form, and uh, just even looking at things, listening to economists that say uh, maybe for the next five years or so we're going to have 10% uh, plus inflation every single year. And just think if we have rent caps at 3% for the next five years and what that would do um, when, we, when our expenses are going up. It's already that way for us. And so um, just rent control really not being the best thing for us. But this is not about rent control. And, uh, but anyway, I just wanted to, to mention that, put that out there. But I really, really want you guys to, to be exposed to Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association and um, I want you to give to them you know, and help them out. And there's a couple different ways to do that, and we'll get into it. But I um, just want you to be aware of that. And if you uh, are new to us, you can subscribe to a free email. And we give updates, and we tell you what different live stream content that's coming up. And uh, we have a trade show coming up as well. But you can sign up for that that. Uh, that um, email that free email at aoausa.com if you go down to the bottom on the right side there's a, a subscribe a place where you can subscribe and we just try to keep you updated on what's happening in your area and anyway so um, yeah so AOA one of the largest individually organized groups of apartment owners here in the state of California and uh, we just have incredible members talking with a guy yet I mean just Every time I interact, it just seems like I'm meeting these incredible people and incredible members. And I'm really looking forward to the in-person trade show at the very end of the month in October at the Long Beach Convention Center. It's really going to be amazing. Um, we're going to have Mr. Landlord there. KTS is going to be there. Dennis Block will be there. Uh, Michael Brennan. Uh, there's a, a bunch of people that have just paved incredible ways of success for others and having them share 
uh, it's really going to be a, an incredible time. And there will be more details about that uh, as we get closer to it. And we'll kind of expose you to some of those speakers before they, before they actually speak. But you're going to want to mark your calendar for October 27th, and it will be great. Also, if you, are, if you need closed captions, if you go to Facebook, even now, you can catch this live on Facebook with the closed caption. So please definitely head over there if, if that will help you out. And um, anyway, we're just thankful for Scott Properties for being a sponsor for this uh, live stream. And also just Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Foundation for making themselves available. Um, they're dedicated to the protection of Proposition 13 and the advancement of taxpayers' rights, including the right to limited taxation, the right, right to vote on tax increases, and the right to economic, economical, equitable, and efficient use of taxpayer dollars. And so that's what they're all about. Man, I'm yes, 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 check me off on all those. Same thing. And so we have the Vice President of Communications from Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association uh, live with us today. So I'm very excited. Um, she's also a columnist and editorial writer for the Southern California News Group. There's 11 daily papers, including Orange County Register and the LA Daily News. And uh, she takes, she's a frequent guest on Southern California radio and TV news and interview shows and she's the host of the Howard Jarvis podcast for KABC and I, I saw one of her articles a few months back and I said man this is amazing I believe we ran it in our magazine and so I was it's just really an honor to even be able to have uh, our speaker on on the show with us today so uh, Susan Shelley we want to welcome you and, and give you the floor now My name is Susan Shelley, and I'm the Vice President of Communications for the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. And I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you about a really dangerous bill for Los Angeles County. It's in Sacramento right now. It could be voted on tomorrow in the Appropriations Committee, and it could go to the floor for a vote pretty quickly. It is Senate Bill 679 from Senator Sidney Comlogger. And what it does is it creates the LA County Affordable Housing Solutions Agency. Now, doesn't that sound great? Affordable Housing Solutions. Let's translate that for taxpayers. Solutions from the government means more taxes. What this would do is it would create a new taxing authority. It would have a governing board, 21 members from across all the communities in LA County, and they would have the ability to vote, to put tax increases on the ballot. They could put parcel taxes on the ballot. Parcel taxes are additional property taxes on top of the taxes you already owe. That's an additional property tax per parcel. Sometimes it's based on square footage. Sometimes it's just a flat fee. But in any case, it's not controlled by Prop 13. It's a workaround. So this new agency would be able to vote to put parcel taxes on the ballot for voter approval. It would be able to raise its own revenue by putting business taxes on the ballot, such as gross receipts taxes, possibly on landlords. They could put gross receipts taxes on landlords to fund affordable housing. They could put any kind of tax on there. They can put all kinds of bond debt on the ballot, which would, it would enable them to raise money by burdening taxpayers for three decades to pay it all back. And then they would decide how the money is spent. And they could spend the money to acquire properties, to develop properties, to rehab properties for affordable housing. What this essentially does is it creates a public housing agency separate from the rest of the government. Now, why doesn't the county just do this by itself? The county can put a tax on the ballot. The county board of supervisors can. The county can form joint powers authorities with different cities and put, put measures on the ballot for specific problems and specific projects. But the politicians, they don't really want their fingerprints on tax increases. So they wanna offload this to a new agency, which will have only the responsibility of raising taxes for these different public housing projects. And this, this troubles me very much because what they're doing is they're trying to drive 
private rental housing business owners out of business. All of the rent control, all of the regulations, the eviction moratorium, the various things that have burdened the owners of rental property, all seem to be moving in the same direction, which is to create distressed properties, to turn profitable businesses into distressed properties that can then be scooped up at fire sale prices. In fact, one city council member, Mike Bonin, even said so. Fire sale prices during the pandemic. To buy these properties, nonprofits can buy them, turn them into some form of public housing. This is not the answer. This is not the answer. But this is what they're trying to do with SB 679. It can still be stopped. So let me stop right now and tell you what you can do to stop SB 679 from passing. You can go to the assembly website, go to assembly.ca.gov slash assembly members, and that will take you to the page with all their names and phone numbers. Make the phones ring. Send that link out by email to your whole list and invite them to call and say, it will only take a minute, call and say no on SB 679. We don't need higher taxes for public housing projects. We need market housing that works. We need to let business owners run their business. Not that complicated. This was always the solution to housing. It's a private enterprise solution that can work. The last thing we need in LA County is higher taxes, especially on property owners who are already struggling to pay all their bills, the utility bills, the taxes, and all of it. It's all so expensive. As you well know, go to the hardware store and buy new locks. Everything's more expensive when you try to run a business in LA County. We have enough with the sales taxes and all the rest. And yet here would be this new taxing authority separate from the rest of the government that would be able to go vote to put taxes on. And here's the thing, you know, they'll all be titled on the ballot. The Home Sweet Home for Puppies and Kittens Act. They'll all pass because people won't realize that their tax increases or they'll vote for it because it's a tax increase on somebody else. And what's the effect? Election after election with all these different taxes being added to your local ballot, election after election, people can get taxed right out of their property. And we have to stop this from happening. We have to tell Sacramento, no more taxes, no new taxes, no tax increases. How much money do they want? They are rolling in cash at this point with a giant record surplus, probably an illegal giant record surplus that they should be refunding to the taxpayers. And they're not, not sufficiently. So this is the, this is the challenge that faces us. Now, this idea came from San Francisco. San Francisco is a little different situation. They have a Bay Area regional housing agency. But San Francisco has a lot of counties over the same sort of metropolitan area, where in LA County, we have one big county with 88 cities, and we have the taxing authority already, but it's in the politicians' hands, and they're too smart politically to put some of these things on the ballot. So this is really important. Also, if you're in the city of LA, be aware, there is a measure that's gonna be on the city ballot that will authorize an additional 5,000 units of low-income housing, public housing essentially, in every council district. And this authorization is because Article 34 of the, of the state constitution requires that in order for certain types of low rent housing to be built, voters must approve it. And so it's on the ballot, 5,000 units in every council district. If you combine that with the funding mechanisms that are in SB 679, I think what you're looking at is the Cabrini Green New Deal. I think you're looking at public housing replacing private mom and pop landlords. And to me, that's, that's, just, that's just distressing. You know, rental housing always used to be a great business for people. It was a great business for immigrants and retirees. It was a great business for people who just wanted to work hard and didn't have a lot of professional opportunities for whatever reason in other fields. It was a great business. And it's been eroded and eroded, and it's beginning to look really intentional. There are a lot of things that can be done in California policy, kind of off topic from today, but there are a lot of things that can be done in California policy to increase housing production throughout the state. 
not density necessarily, but just housing production everywhere. And there are many environmental regulations and laws that prevent that because something like 15 years ago, they thought it was sprawl and they thought sprawl was bad for the climate. And so essentially housing production in California was very, very restricted. And here we are these years later with a housing crisis, not enough production. You can certainly see how expensive it is to build anything in California, the building permits, the regulations, the various mandates, it makes it very difficult and expensive to develop new housing. So what are they doing? They're coming after existing buildings and trying to turn them into public housing at taxpayer expense and calling that a solution. I don't think it's a solution. I just don't think so. I really feel that the best solution is property owners in business meeting the market where it is at all price points in all neighborhoods. And that the best way to do this is through private enterprise. That's the most flexible, that's the most responsive, that's the most, let's just say it, free in a free country where you can go into business and have the fruits of your labor not taken away from you. That's just, it's just fundamental. Property rights are fundamental to freedom. So the property owner's fight, the landlord's fight is everybody's fight. If the government can come in and take what you've built, you're not free. This is serious stuff. I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here. I could go on my soapbox, but this is just know that this is a big deal. This is not just one more, one more regulation or one more tax. This is an assault on your entire industry. It's an assault on your savings. It's an assault on your business. In some ways, it's an assault on your children. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Proposition 19, which passed in 2020, changed the rules for parent-child transfers of property. And it's going to hit apartment owners very, very hard. Under Prop 58, which passed in 1986, by the way, a unanimous vote of the legislature to put it on the ballot and 75% approval by the voters. What that said was that parents could transfer property to their children without having it reassessed to market value. And this is really important because market value goes up and up and under Prop 13, the property tax bill is based on 1% of the market value when the property changes hands. This was driving people out of their property in the 1980s because of inflation. So in 1986, Prop 58 was passed. What it said was parents could transfer a home of any value and up to a million dollars of assessed value of other property to their kids without reassessment. So that was a duplex, a small apartment building, a million dollars of assessed value was excluded from reassessment. So the, essentially the tax bill on small apartment buildings would stay the same when the kids inherited the building. Well, now that's gone. That's gone. It was passed unanimously in the legislature, 75% of the voters, and it's gone. Proposition 19, which appeared to be about helping wildfire victims, actually repealed Prop 58. So now what we have is a limited exclusion only for the principal residence when it's transferred. And for apartment buildings, for small businesses of any kind, for any other property besides the principal residence, reassessed to market value as of the date of death. As soon as that property is inherited by a new owner, reassessed to current market value. Well, what happens in a rent controlled building if the owner can't raise the rents to cover this higher expense. Suddenly the business doesn't pencil out and most likely that building will be sold by the heirs. Instead of staying in the family and continuing to support the family, that business will be lost and sold. And what's the new owner gonna do? With the taxes, with the expenses, it's not gonna pencil out for them either. So it's very likely that this mom and pop apartment building that was home to longtime tenants and everybody was happy and it was going very well, all of a sudden it could be sold to be turned into something else and not be rental housing at all. And how does that help us? How does that help the housing crisis? Something like 55% of all the rental units, you probably know this better than I do, if I'm wrong, correct me on the figure, but something like 55% of all the rental units in California are owned by mom and pop landlords. Proposition 19's provision 
barring the tax, barring the tax exclusion, the reassessment exclusion on parent child transfers. Proposition 19 could wipe out half the affordable housing in California in one generation. This is serious stuff. And really this has to be fixed. Now the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association has been working very hard on this, as you probably know, because you guys were so helpful and thank you for that. Uh, we circulated petitions to get something on the ballot this year that reversed that part of Prop 19 and put Prop 58 back in the, um, in the constitution. And unfortunately, we came up a little short on the signatures. We didn't have very much time. You only get 180 days to collect a million signatures. And we made it to about 402,000 before we ran out of time. But we may try again. So stay tuned because this problem needs fixing. And we feel very strongly that people didn't even know what they were voting on. They thought it was about wildfire victims and transferring your old property tax bill to a new home when you move. And it was, and that's fine. And we, we wouldn't change any of that. But this part where you lose the parent child transfer exclusion and the property is reassessed to market value, very, very damaging. Damaging to families, damaging to tenants, damaging to the rental housing business, damaging just generally. So this is one more thing that uh, your government has done to the rental housing business that's not great. Uh, AB 679 is not the only bill this year that the uh, legislature is looking at that would do this kind of new taxing authority. There's also one in San Diego. So if anyone on this call is in San Diego, be aware of SB 1105, which does the same thing. Senate Bill 1105 creates, I think it gave, they gave it a name like the Environmentally Friendly Housing Agency. Well, it's not all that friendly. What it does is it has the power to put tax increases on the ballot and then build public housing. And by the way, all of these bills, when they build public housing or rehab public housing, they are required to pay prevailing wages on those, for the labor on those projects. Well, what that means, if you're not familiar with it, is the construction costs are very much higher than they would be if you paid market rate for labor. You can't just go out and hire people, you have to pay the highest union wage found anywhere in the region. This is how in Los Angeles, the homeless housing that's being built under Prop HHH is costing $600,000 a unit. That's how you get there. You pay the prevailing wage and you have all these various, let's call them interceptors of the tax money that are in there consulting in between the, uh, the funding and the building. And you wind up with this very bloated budget that doesn't produce very much of what was intended. So that's a problem. Uh, under SB 679 and SB 1105, anyone who is taking that money and building these projects must sign the labor agreement in the county or in the city and must pay prevailing wages for all the labor. And so it will cost just as much as it's humanly possible for it to cost to build the so-called affordable housing, which means that there won't be enough money for it and the taxes will have to go up. And there will be this continuous drumbeat from this agency because its purpose, its sole purpose is to be a taxing authority and then spend the money on public housing. That's its purpose. So that's what it'll do every year. It'll find a new tax to raise. And this is just mischievous. It's mischievous for the board of supervisors to try to offload this to a, an agency instead of taking responsibility for the burden they're putting on taxpayers themselves. So go to assembly.ca.gov slash assembly members, and you'll get the whole list. If you wanna call just your own rep, you can go to findyourrep.legislature.ca.gov, and you can look up your representative, or you can just Google for it, or do it the old fashioned way in a phone book. It's in the government pages of your local phone book and call them and say no on SB 679, no on SB 1105, stop the war on landlords. Public housing is not the solution. You know, in the 1960s, public housing projects were built with high expectations that this would solve the problem. And they were dynamited a few years later because it didn't work. It didn't work. Market rate, private enterprise, 
is far superior to government public housing. This is a, a solution whose time has come and gone. And we do not need this Cabrini Green New Deal in Los Angeles. No on SB 679. And I'm happy to take your questions on any subject. All right, great. Thank you so much for uh, sharing with us. And um, definitely we have some questions. And it's amazing that this is, it's SB. So you're like, why is this? SB, it really should be something local. And so it, it's it's crazy and I think it's confusing. So does everybody in the whole state vote for this? this I is mean, that's, state, a, it's that's not a silly a- question, but it feels like a silly question because I'm a little confused, honestly, okay. about how that works. Because it's SB, doesn't everybody in the whole state vote on it? Or how does that work? It's a Senate bill. It's in the legislature. It already passed the Senate and it's currently in the assembly. Mm-hmm. And And the reason it's in the legislature is because state law doesn't allow these agencies to just form themselves and start taxing people. So you need state law authorizing the creation of the agency which has these designated responsibilities. So that's what this is. If this this legislation passes, then this agency will be created in LA County. And then the agency will have its 21 governing board members who will vote on tax increases and those tax increases will go on the ballot. So this is a multi-step process. I'm sure that if you asked any of these lawmakers, if if SB 679 is a tax increase, they would say, oh no, it's not a tax increase. No, it's a two-step process. It authorizes an agency to authorize a tax increase on the ballot. And the the trouble with this is everybody is having trouble with affording housing in California. A hundred percent of us are finding that California is too expensive to live in, right? A hundred percent of us are talking with our friends about, I don't know, Texas. And we don't want to go to Texas. We want California to be working the way it should be working. And this is one of the reasons it doesn't because of these two-step things where you can't see what they're doing until it's too late to do anything about it. So this, if we stop this, we don't have to worry about these local taxes from this agency. So we really got to get the phones ringing. So yeah, people are curious. So it's not LA city, it's LA County. And it applies to all cities within LA County, Right. whether there's rent control, whether it's RSO or not, it's blanket everybody, correct? It's everybody. Well, it's, okay. it's the authority to put taxes on the ballot that can be paid by anybody. So they could raise the sales tax. They could put a parcel tax on the ballot that, that property owners pay. They could put a document transfer tax on the ballot that that burdens real estate transactions. They could put anything, a business, a a gross receipts tax on businesses. They could put any kind of tax on the ballot that they wanted to. Anything they thought that they could talk the voters into passing. So so it's not even necessarily just an attack on housing providers. It's just, it's something that gives them even broader authority than that. Exactly. But because it's related to housing, you would think that they would be targeting housing providers. Well, I think where they're going to target housing providers is when they start trying to buy apartment buildings to rehab into public housing. And I think this this will work hand in glove with other policies that distress people, that cause Mm -hmm. financial distress. And it creates an incentive to cause financial distress on landlords so that those buildings will be sold. I think they're going to try to grind you to death uh, so that they can jump in with their new agency and buy your building and turn it into public housing. Right. And I know, Susan, there's a lot of, there's even people watching right now that would be like, Susan, you're crazy. Uh, They're not trying to do that. Well, you can judge for yourself whether I'm crazy (laughs) or not. You can, you can judge for yourself by whether the kinds of comments from people like city council member Mike Bonin, where he said, oh, this, is, yeah. this pandemic is an opportunity. We'll be able to buy these apartment buildings at fire sale prices, and then nonprofits can run them as, quote, affordable housing. I mean, he said that. He said that. And right. you've experienced yourself what they've done in Los Angeles County with rent control moratoriums and uh, eviction eviction moratoriums rather and a, and a moratorium on raising rents even though 
under rent control, you're allowed to, they have a moratorium on raising rents. How much are they grinding you? How much are they trying to cause you financial distress? I don't mean to be a conspiracy theorist, but there it is right in front yeah. of you. Yeah. And I would, I would agree with you. And I think for me, I'm like, which way is it going to go? Is it going to go the fascist way where we still own everything, but yet they're fully controlling it? And I don't mean Nazi. I mean, fascist in the in, in the in the in the in the, def, in the definition in the webster's dictionary from 1995 yeah. it things change and even the way they define fascism has changed but just originally what we used to call fascism which is the government controlling you owning it it seems like we're going that way but this here would be more like going more of a you know public housing which is more of a socialist way and so if gosh, I'm like, which way are they going to try to do both or, or what? But it's, it's either way, it's not good. Either way, it doesn't work. And, and like I said, I lived for a long time in countries with communism and I've, and I've seen government housing really, really not work and incredible shortage of housing as well as just the quality of housing, not being awesome at all. Like you can't even compare um, what what I ex- what I experienced with what we have today in LA, and um, I think people don't understand that there's a that what happens is you know you talked about them as uh, interceptors, <laughs> but th- whenever it goes money goes to the government, there's just so many ways that it that the money gets shaken out. And I like how you talked about the prevailing wage to help people understand one of the many ways that it's, it's so inefficient to give money to the government and have the government do something. And um, what I don't think people understand is that when the government has money, it's not just that it's being disseminated equally. It's actually, there are their own companies who their cousin owns or what have you, their own connections, and they're, they're going to be giving jobs to those people. And so it, it creates a have and have not uh, system that you can't even imagine. And, and we look and, and it distresses us and we love homeless people. We want to see them taken care of. We want them to do well. Um, but yet, another system is going to create more have nots than what we already have. So that's uh, something that I just think that a lot of people that are voting, they just don't realize it. And I wish that there was a way to convince people. Um, but Tula, she's asking, is this for any homeowner in California? She's up in, in uh, Northern California and she always watches. So it's good to have you on. Um, and so, no, it's, this is, LA, LA and then you mentioned San Diego with 11 SB 1105. Right. So those two places specifically. But I think if it's something that everybody's voting on, everyone in the state needs to know about it, right? Right. But you can call your you can call the entire assembly and say no on these two bills and stop this kind of thing. You know, mm-hmm. there was another one a year or two ago that would have created an air district taxing authority that went over four counties in Southern California. And they wanted to have a board that would be able to put taxes on the ballot. And they needed the legislature to do that. And the South Coast Air Quality Management District staff thought that was just a great idea. They hired a consultant, they hired a pollster, they started calling people saying, would you like clean air? Well, yes, we would like clean air. Would you like higher taxes? That they didn't ask. But what they were going to try to do was create a a new district where people in four separate counties would be voting on these tax increases. They wanted a half cent sales tax to fund, I think, subsidies for electric cars. I think that was the plan. And it didn't make it out of the legislature. So this is the trick to watch. It's very complicated, but it's like enabling legislation followed by taxing authority, followed by tax proposals, followed by tax increases. And we're gonna stop the enabling legislation if we can Right. And that will prevent the whole rest of the program from going forward. Okay, Deshaun Ward, he's got a great question here. Will the city councilmen own, manage, and pay developers? So definitely not own. But what? who controls what in this? I think that's the, the real question. Who, so this sets up a, another authority, but what 
what connection does city council have? Like, would well, the they city, have? The city council would not have a connection. This would be the, this would be a little bit like um, the Joint Powers Authority, LASA, the Homeless Services Agency. It, it's sort of its own world and it answers to itself. This would be a, an agency that would put tax increases on the ballot, try to pass them, uh, pay its own expenses out of the revenue, and then try to buy or rehab housing. And who would run it? They might run it directly. They might contract with a nonprofit to run it. Uh, it would not be the county running it or any of the cities running it, which is, which is a problem too, because your local elected officials are more accountable. Your city council is more accountable. Your county board of supervisors is more accountable. Mm. This agency, it would run like Metro does. You know, there would be appointees to the, mm -hmm. to the board and they would make their decisions and they would have all their public hearings, which no one knows about. And they would, they would just blitz everyone with mindless waves of, of statistics that are incomprehensible. And then they would say, well, we explained it to the public. And that's yeah. how this would work. This would be one more of those. Right. So give me, so August here, he has, how can we stop this bill if we do not have a credible response that it won't work? So what, to translate that, give us your, the best talking points. If you were to capsulize okay. just a few talking points, so you, you lay them call, out for us. You call the assembly and and they answer the phone right there. That's probably not going to happen. But let's say you call these. <laughs> <and> they, <laughs> You're going to leave a message, right? <laughs> you leave a message. <laughs> Here's your message. Please vote no on SB 679. We do not need any more taxes in Southern California. We do not need a taxing authority. We do not need any more taxes. No on 679. Stop these tax increases. Okay. So for you, one simple thing. It's just stop taxes because more taxes make it harder for everybody to live. Right. We already have inflation. We don't need to add more burden to people that are just trying to get by. Exactly. And I would say, I mean, for me, this is, I'm really against public housing because I've seen it not work. And I, and then on conversely, I've seen how much devotion, sacrifice, uh, blood, sweat, and tears that our members put into their properties. And that doesn't happen when you're a hireling. When you own it, you treat it way differently than even a property management company would. But a property management company still, they have a real incentive to take care of your property, right? right. These guys are just absolutely not. So you're what you said about the 1960s where they gave that a try and it didn't work, you could point them back you could uh, another talking point I would I would say would be, look, we've done public housing before, been there, done that, and it doesn't work. We could point to other countries that currently have uh, public housing or where it's super controlled, and we could look at some of those and say, well, look here, this is it's public housing, but and it's affordable, but you have to wait five years to get a place, right? If look at Sweden, right? That's if I, I believe it's Sweden where. I think it's Sweden. Anyway, we're, that's what you have to wait. If you want like a three bedroom place, it's wait five years. And then there, it's amazing that they have very little corruption. But in most places, and if I look even in our own city, look at LA County, how many council members <laughs> have been busted for corruption? You know, I mean, it's, it's like FBI, every other year. The FBI is running out of handcuffs. It's getting so bad. <laughs> Yeah. So corruption is just rampant in our city, in our state. And that's what makes things not work. Like, even if you wanted communism to work, you would have to have zero corruption for it to theoretically work. But unfortunately, it just doesn't, you know, we are people and we would love to have our kids have a little bit more than the other kid. Right. So that's so those are some talking points. Um, the inefficiency of government to do this, uh, the tax burden, and just the the fact that you have to raise money to do this. You know, you could be raising money to do something else. And uh, yeah, so those those are all really good points. The other thing, one that I don't think people realize, is that. <clears throat> 
government has always seemed to find a way to discriminate. You know, look at FHA loans back in the days. Look at, there's so many different things, so many different ways at so many different levels. So why would you let the government <laughs> do that? One landlord or multiple landlords? Because I know a lot of great landlords and very few that aren't so great. But if our government's a landlord and they're bad, we're really out of luck because there's no way to get around it. If there's one bad landlord, they'll may drive them out, sue them and drive them out of business or right. something. But if it's the government, you were, you literally, you have no choice. And um, yes. those are, those are some things that I can just think of off the top of my head. And, um, and you know, we thing, can, it, you know, it, it can, it can affect all the neighbor's businesses. So if, if a yeah. building next to your building becomes public housing <clears throat> and there are problems because the government does a bad job of managing it, well, that affects, your property, your tenants, your neighborhood, your values, right. all of that. So this is just a really uneven way to do policy. Yeah, and we, we, yeah and, and that's such a good point. Like we had a video, this guy, he was a shot caller for a gang in LA, okay? He did 12 years solitary confinement. He's had a life change, came out, managed property for 10 years. And so he he did a, uh, a live stream with us on how to protect your property with rising crime. And he talked about how you need to own it. He talked about cleaning everything up and making sure the locks work and having lighting and doing these things. You think the government would do that? <laughs> so yeah. if you think about it, this will, when there's public housing, crime increases. You mentioned Cabin Cabrini Greens. Now, some people may or may not know. I think most of our audience will know about it. But can you just say just one or two sentences of, about what that what you're referring to when you say that? Sure, that was in the Chicago Housing Authority, and they they decided that it would be great to build giant blocks of apartments, and that would be you know brand new wonderful public housing. And to make a long story short, because of management problems from the government <clears throat> and various other types of problems, they had they were overrun with gangs and crime and bad maintenance and deterioration. And eventually it was grenaded. It, it had to be demolished. It became mm -hmm. such, such a symbol for the problems of this policy of public housing. And it eventually was demolished. And another one in Indiana also, I forget the name of it, but all very famous demolition pictures of these towers mm -hmm. coming down. And it was this utopian dream of how this was going to fix everything because the government was gonna provide these, this housing, but the government is incompetent to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. look at what goes on with streetlights, okay? So a streetlight is vandalized. The copper wire is stolen. You call the city to get it fixed. It's a year wait <laughs> to do that. So if you have public housing and it's run in a similar way and you have some sort of problem with whatever, name your problem that can happen to a property and you call the city and say, take care of that. This is a problem in the neighborhood. Good luck. Right. Right. And that's a good, that's a really good example. We had that, we had that happen on our street. And fortunately all of our neighbors were like <laughs> calling and calling and we got it rectified pretty quickly, yeah. but yeah. Okay. So lots of questions. Would the agency's taxes apply to all houses, homes, or just rental homes and property providers? It, it could be either. They could, they could pass any kind of a tax that they wanted. So they could raise the sales tax. They could put a parcel tax on all property owners. They could put a gross receipts tax on rental property. They could put any kind of tax that's legal in California. They could, they could envision, poll test, write up, and put on the ballot. And mm -hmm. then it would be up to people like us to say, please don't vote for it. Vote no on it. But they're going to name it something really charming, mm -hmm. the Hansel and Gretel's Cottage for Everyone Act. And people will say, oh, that sounds so sweet. And they'll vote yes. And, you know, by the time by the time the opposition gets organized and gets the message out, the thing is law. Yeah. And, and this is this is very difficult. OK, Athena on YouTube, where are they getting the money to fund this agency without raising taxes? Good question. It's going to cost a million dollars from some general fund. It might be the state general fund. It might be. The, I think it's the state because the Appropriations Committee is looking at the costs of doing it. So it's a million dollars a year until they can persuade the voters to pass a revenue measure and the money starts rolling into them. 
and then they'll pay their expenses out of that, which is one more reason that you won't get much bang for your buck because you'll be paying all the bureaucrats. Okay, here's a question Darlene uh, has. Why are corporations buying up the single family homes knowing that, that the government strategy is to force them into distressed property? Is that the end game for the corporation? Oh, what is the end game for the corporation? You know, I'm really, I'm really not sure what the end game for the corporation is. I think this is very risky for the whole, for the whole economy because if you remember in 2008 when we had the big crash, it was because Wall Street got involved in the housing business. In that case, they were buying the mortgages and they were chopping them up and putting them into these supposedly triple A financial instruments that were so safe. They were absolutely safe because what's the likelihood that everybody gets foreclosed on at the same time, right? Well, then everybody got foreclosed on at the same time and the whole world's financial system just about went under because all these pension funds and, or, and city governments, and national governments were invested in these instruments and the banks were invested and there was insurance on them and the insurance companies were at risk and everybody was at risk at the same time from this foreclosure wave. So when corporations on Wall Street get involved in the single family housing business that way, it's risky. Suppose they all decide to sell at the same time because of who knows what, a tax change, a regulatory change, a market <clears throat> prediction, an interest rate shift. And they all decide that at the same time, American Homes for Rent and all these other companies, they, are, they all decide to sell at the same time. It's going to cause a crash. So I don't really know what the end game is. They all jumped in. This whole idea of um, corporations buying single family homes as rentals as a as a sector, as a business, this came out of the 2008 crash when you had this all this distressed inventory at the same time and Wall Street came in. I don't remember if the government pushed them to do that. Could be that the Treasury Department pushed some of these hedge funds to go in and try to make a market, and bail, bail people out. I'm not sure. But wherever it came from, whoever's, whosever idea it was, it's now a Wall Street sector. And uh, we're kind of stuck with it. They are out there paying cash for homes, outbidding young couples who want to buy their first home, driving the prices up. Uh, and the way they're driving them up, they could drive them down. This is this mm -hmm. is an interesting situation. Right. And I know that it, everybody has a lot of opinions on this. <laughs> you probably could just blow up the YouTube page right now. You probably are. And um, But yeah, you know, it, it, there's a lot of uncertainty. And I think there's a lot of economists that would say we're going to see double digit inflation for the next five years. And when you look at supp supply and demand, there's an argument saying that, hey, you know, prices may still go up. It may be stagflation. It may just things may hold their value. And if, if these guys buy and hold and collect rent, then maybe it's a good maybe it is they're seeing something that no one else has seen. And, and as far as the inflation and what things are worth today and what it'll be worth in five, 10 years. So who knows? Um, who knows? And yeah, so yes, your retirement is paying, is funding this, right? If you're, if you're, you know, name the big group, if you have a retirement fund, your 401k is probably funding it. Um, Sienna asks, what's the difference between SB 679 and the 1105? And again, 679 is LA County. And the 1105 is for San Diego County, or is it probably County, right? County, San Diego yeah. County. Yeah, they're, so, they're, they're a little different in their, in their particulars, how big the governing board is, things like that. But basically, it's the same idea. It's a new taxing authority that can put taxes on the ballot. Mm -hmm. All right, Kathy, if this were to end up on the ballot, would all of California be voting on this or only Los Angeles County? So that was the question I asked earlier. Okay, well, these bills will not be on the ballot. This is legislation. Uh, if it passes the assembly and the Senate concurs in any amendments, it'll go to the governor's desk. And if the governor signs it into law, it will set up these agencies. And then the agencies will invent taxes and those tax proposals will go on the ballot. And they will only go on the ballot in LA County and San Diego County. So even if you're in another, even if you're not in LA County, you need to get on the phone big time right now. So that's why we did this. Normally we would do it on a Thursday more. Normally we would schedule further out, but because of the, the time sensitivity on this one, that's why we're doing this now, everybody. 
you got to share this information. You got to get this out to as many people as you can. Let them know to, to, to get the phones ringing. So please, please, please send the link out to as many people as you can. Yes. And, um, and please do it today because the vote will be today. Tomorrow. Yeah, right. The vote, the vote will be tomorrow. Okay. So let's see. Billy Horowitz, daddy recently. Dad recently passed, left his primary residence to us. We will, will we have to pay current market property taxes? Well, this is a little outside the scope. Um, let's see, Gregory, does it really help to call our reps and government officials? They only respond to their campaign donors. Well, it's been my experience that if you ring those phones, <clears throat> it has an effect. I mean, we've done this at Howard Jarvis a number of times where we just light up the phones. And they suddenly become aware that someone's watching. And that very often will change the behavior because a lot of those, a lot of those people who are not from LA County, not from San Diego County, they're not personally invested in the outcome of this bill. They're just going along with what leadership is requesting or what their colleagues are requesting. If they see a price to be paid politically, or they think it's controversial, or some, they think that someone's gonna say, well, you voted to raise taxes. And they don't know that they're voting to raise taxes. They could they could hit the brakes and vote mm. no or, or, or lay off and not vote at all. So it does make a difference. But the, I don't think it helps to email because I don't think they read the email. I mm. think it helps to ring the phone and okay. basically just do everything you can to make them know that people are watching. Great. All right. Let's see. Yeah, here's a question. Um, if current tenants are replaced by homeless and public housing, then where do the current tenants go? <laughs> a very good question. Good point. Oh. Okay. Again, yeah, county supervisors would not be running the show on this. It's its own thing. I think how you you gave the example of the metro. <laughs> you know, that's kind of a interesting way to think of it. There, I like a good example, I think. Yeah, they is would there a, the same way they would they would have their own taxing authority the way they put it was measure M on the ballot uh, they have their own taxing authority and then they spend the money themselves and the mm -hmm. and the county's like well it's not us Armando here has a great question is there a voting scoreboard you know so like we would it'd be strategic to call the people that we could influence and so is there a scoreboard that you have of people that are opposing people that are kind of on the on the fence? Well, you can see on the legislature's website, if you go to leginfo, L-E-G-I-N-F-O, leginfo.legislature.ca.gov, and you look up SB 679, you'll get the page for the legislation. There's a tab in their menu bar that says votes, and you can see how everybody voted in committee. So okay, can you say that one again? Sure. Leginfo. Leginfo.legislature.ca.gov. Okay. And you, you type in, it'll say bill search, and you type in SB 679. It will come up. And then you click the tab that says votes. You'll see a, a tab says text, votes, status, bill analysis. If you're interested in the details of what's, what's in this, you can read the bill analysis and it will... It will give you the information that the legislative analyst gave to the legislators, what they're using to vote. So uh, one of the points that they made in that bill analysis is that this is completely unnecessary because all this authority already exists in the county. Mm -hmm. they, can, they can already vote for any of this and buy any of these projects and impose the restrictions for prevailing wage. They can do everything that's in this bill without the taxing agency. You don't need the new taxing authority at all. Right. And Deshaun Ward's asking, what assemblyman, councilman, senator is supporting the mom and pop landlords? And I think where you need to start is engage. If you call them, you will find out immediately where they stand. <laughs> and um, if they don't answer the phone, then that's where you need to email and schedule an appointment to, to speak with somebody, ask them to give you a call and let them know where they're at. And you can Look at sometimes they have things on their website that kind of give you an idea of where they're at. Um, so we'll, really, I want to encourage you to engage and understand where your council member, where your the assembly person, those people understand where they're at. And because there's some of them 
we need to express gratitude. We need to say, hey, thank you for being a supporter. Thank you for trying to protect property rights. So some of them need that kind of a phone call. Others need, man, get with it. <laughs> what are you doing? Do you understand that you're making it worse for everybody? So um, here and we go. And it's an election year, so they should take your call. Right, right. Okay, how can we convince the auto warranty spam callers to support our cause and go nuts calling the government to support <laughs> us? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> right. So very funny, Michael. And it's not funny if this thing happens, so it's really not funny. And it's it's just it's taking us further down a path where um that's doomed to for failure really doomed for failure. You can see it in so many other countries. You can see it in the own, our own past. And so guys, I don't want to take any more time. I want you to get off, <laughs> stop watching this video and start making phone calls. So we'll say that. And then also, if you want, if you really like on our website, there's the AOAUSA.com forward slash pack. There's a place where you can put in your, um, your address, your street address, and then it will populate all the different um, all your different representatives. So you can find, take a look there on that. We're trying to make it easy for you guys to, to contact people, but make the phone calls, not the emails this time. Thank you so much, uh, Susan. Thank really appreciate it. Thank you. Let me put in a plug for the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. If you're a property owner in California and you're not already a member of HJTA, <clears throat> we will work for you anyway. But, okay. but oh. join, be a member of HJTA. Right. Go to hjta.org, sign up for the free emails, click join us. It's only $15 a year and we will keep you informed of all of these important issues related to taxes for property owners. Really the best organization in California yeah. for homeowners and property owners with regard to taxes alone. We work really yeah. hard at that. So join us and be a contributor. You can contribute to the foundation, which pays for our lawsuits and our legal actions against cities that illegally raise taxes and, and the foundation donations are tax deductible, or you can support the organization's lobbying and general efforts with a donation to the association. And we right. appreciate it. And I really wanted you to make that. We talked about it before, so I'm glad that you you said it there. We do have at the bottom there, we have the uh, hjta.org so people can see that right now. And they've got a phone number. So light up the phones with your assembly person, but light up the phones with... <laughs> with them too. And please donate to them because they're doing great work and uh, we fully support them as well. And again, um, Susan, thank you so much for your time thank and you, everyone Jeff. else. Thank you for, for caring about California, caring about LA and San Diego. And let's, uh, let's get this thing done. Thank you. You got it. Take care. All right. <laughs>